بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues, this is one of the hard topics in the head and neck imaging and um, I will uh, try to simplify it as much as I, as I can. Uh, it will concern with imaging of the skull base. As you all know that uh, uh, this is uh, one of the important areas in the head and neck imaging because uh, the skull base is considered the pathway for many of the structures going to the intracranium or outside the cranium and uh, the skull base is usually divided into three parts the anterior skull base the middle and the posterior skull base and we have uh, three parts of this the, the this topic and i will handle in each part one of the areas of the skull base and now we'll deal with the anterior skull base you all know that we have uh, many imaging modalities that can uh, fit for evaluation of skull base lesions, including the X-rays, the CT, MRI, and geography, whether conventional or imaging, uh, or imaging uh, or through imaging, and also uh, PET scan may have some of the benefits in this area. Uh, CT and MRI are the main diagnostic uh, modalities used for evaluation of the skull base and the CT is usually uh, helpful in evaluation of the bony anatomy of the skull base as well as the skull base foramina detecting the cortical margins and the neurovascular foramina detecting fibrosis skull base lesions and then this will uh, be uh, shown during the lecture the evaluation of fibrous dysplasia and other tumors of fibrous origin are better assessed by CT uh, than MRI. Also, uh, CT is more helpful, of course, than plain X-ray and MRI in detection of calcium as well as the detection of bone sclerosis. Uh, one of the uh, best values for CT is the assessment of fractures and post-traumatic CSF uh, leak. The MRI is very important in evaluation of uh, dural and leptomeningeal invasion by skull-based tumors and also the intracranial extension of these tumors. Uh, one of the main values also is uh, of MRI is to uh, evaluate the extension of the tumor along the nerve roots, very neural, very vascular spread, as well as evaluation of bone marrow uh, involvement. Usually, uh, we use the T1 and T2 weighted images supported by uh, the fat suppression uh, technique, and the slice thickness is in the range of three millimeter. Uh, the stair images which are uh, used, uh, which are helpful uh, in fat suppression to see uh, uh, some of the bone marrow lesions in this area. And diffusion weighted images are extremely important in evaluation of the head and neck in general and the skull base uh, lesions in particular. The gradient uh, images or t T2 star images can uh, show the blooming effect in cases where calcium is present and also uh, hemorrhage or hemocytrin and uh, sometimes melanin if present. Then uh, what are uh, the important roles of imaging in this particular area? Number one is the detection of the lesion and to show its accurate extensions, to show accurately its extensions. Then differentiation between benign and malignant lesions and uh, looking for the possible uh, risk-stability of the tumor, including invasion of the important structures like the orbit extension along the nerve roots 
or invasion of the cavernous sinus and major vascular structures, dural and parenchymal invasion. Then the dural invasion is one of the uh, major tasks of MRI in evaluation of skull-based lesions, and uh, this will uh, significantly decrease the five-year survival rate. The uh, main diagnostic uh, sign of dural invasion is the presence of nodular or linear plural, uh, dural thickening, which is uh, thicker than 5 mm in thickness. And you can see here, this is a calvarial lesion which has invaded the dura, diagnosed, diagnosed by uh, considerable thickening of the dura and enhancement. And if there is a dural enhancement of less than 5 mm thickness, they, this may uh, not represent a dural invasion, but maybe reaction to the uh, uh, contact of the tumor to the dura. And very, very neural uh, spread is well known in uh, this particular lesion, which is the adenoid cystic carcinoma, but can occur in many of other tumors. This is the most common lesion to spread by along the nerve roots, but squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, lymphoma, uh, breast carcinoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, neuroblastoma, and many other tumors can uh, spread by nerve roots. Uh, the most commonly affected nerve root is the fifth, the trigeminal nerve, but can occur along any of the well-known cranial uh, nerves. This will lead to invasion of the cavernous sinus, invasion of the uh, cranial nerve itself, and uh, invasion of the skull base, and it is also associated with poor uh, prognosis. Then we classify the skull-based diseases into congenital, inflammatory, traumatic, and uh, neoblastic. Uh, congenital lesions like uh, nasal glioma, nasal dermoid, encephalocele, meningocele, and uh, russic cleft cyst. Inflammation like biogenic fungus and uh, tuberculous infection. Non-infective like sarcoidosis and Wagner granulomatosis, as well as mucoceles traumatic fractures and CSF leaks, as well as the neoplastic lesions. These tumors can occur anywhere in the skull base, in the anterior skull base, or the middle or the posterior one. And we will also show examples uh, of these lesions whenever we uh, handle any of the three components of the skull base. Fibrous dysplasia, disease chondrosarcoma, squamous and adenocarcinoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, lymphoma, meningioma, metastasis, and uh, the plasma cytoma, its uh, counterpart, the multiple myeloma. Then uh, these are the skull, anterior skull-based lesions that we are going to discuss, including the encephalocele, and this is one of the important issues, which is known as arrested pneumatization, fracture and CSF leaks, and then uh, uh, some of the baronasal sinus lesions that can uh, involve the anterior skull base like mucoceles, fungal sinusitis, inverted babyloma, carcinoma, lymphoma, sarcoma, and the metastatic deposits. Also, one of the uh, well-known tumors of the anterior skull base is the isinogenic neuroplastoma, Cisino neuroblastoma or olfactory neuroblastoma, an olfactory group meningioma and skull based deposits. Also, we'll have some words about fibrous dysplasia and Baget's disease. The <coughs> Sorry. Then the anterior skull base is formed by the orbital blade of the frontal bone, and th this one, and the, the cribriform blade of ethmoids as well as the crista galli and in the midline, and posteriorly by the lesser wing of the sphenoid, this green one, as well as part of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. The frontal and the ethmoid sinuses, as well as the nasal cavity and orbits are below the anterior skull base. The frontal lobe meninges are above the anterior skull base. 
and these are the images in the coronal and axial uh, planes showing some of the details of the uh, anterior skull base. One of the important structures is the cribriform plate of ethmoids, this very fine horizontal plate. And this is, of course, the crista galli. And this is the depression for the olfactory uh, bulb or the olfactory groove. And in this axial image, you can see part of the frontal sinuses. And this arrow points to the foramen cecum, which contains nothing and is usually obliterated by uh, fibrous uh, tissue. Then uh, this is uh, what we call the lateral uh, lamella, which is part of the anterior skull base. As I have mentioned, I said that this is the cribriform plate of ethmoids, and this is the crista galli. Then uh, this is what we call the lateral lamella, which is the junction between the cribriform plate of ethmoids and another structure which is present here known as the fovea ethmoidalis. Then uh, the lateral lamella is the intermediate zone between the cribriform plate and the fovea ethmoidalis. And the depth of this area is uh, measured by Kairos and is divided into three uh, types. Type 1, where the depth of the olfactory fossa is less than 3 mm in height. And type 2 is for, from 4 to 7 mm. And type 3 is from 8 to 16 uh, mm. This type 3 is the most vulnerable to iatrogenic injury during endoscopic surgery for the paranasal sinuses. And this is type 1 uh, curious, uh, classification of the depths of the uh, olfactory uh, fossa. And this is type 2 and this is uh, type 3. Then wh what are the communication pathways between the intra and the extracranial uh, uh, areas. Number one, the foramen cecum, which uh, uh, may contain an emissary vein and usually is uh, obliterated by fibrous tissue. The foramina of the cribriform blade of ethmoids, which uh, transmits the olfactory fibers, and the optic nerve canal, which uh, transmits the optic nerve as well as the ophthalmic artery. And this is once more the uh, anatomic details of the anterior skull base. This is the cribriform blade of ethmoids. This is the olfactory fossa. And this is the lateral lamella. And this is the fovea ethmoidalis. And this is the bony nasal septum, as you all know. And this is the uh, middle, middle turbinate or the vertical blade of the middle uh, turbinate. Then... In the sagittal image, you can see clearly this is the frontal sinus, and this is the cribriform blade of ethmoids. This is the esphenoid sinus, and this is the dorsum cilli, and this is the clivus. We'll uh, discuss this in the middle cranial fossa, of course, in charm. Then uh, the first lesion in this uh, part of the skull base is encephalocele. And encephalocele means that there is a herniation of the meninges and CSF as well as maybe part of the brain tissue through a defect in the uh, anterior skull base. This encephalocele uh, may contain or may not contain brain tissue and it is usually uh, communicated directly to the intracranial uh, space and uh, the uh, uh, the contents may show high signal because of the CSF as well as some of the uh, herniated brain tissue which may be uh, disorganized brain tissue. Nasal encephalocele are uh, uh, known as or encephalocele in general are either frontoethmoidal or basal. The frontoethmoidal encephalocele occur at the root of the nose and the basal meningocele occur in the, or posterior to the cribriform blade of uh, ethmoids. 
and this is the appearance of a frontal ethmoidal encephalocele, which is, is herniation of the brain tissue through a defect in the anterior part of the cribriform plate of ethmoids. And this coronal CT, and you can see an opacity here with some uh, defective area in the region of the fovea ethmoidalis. And the coronal MRI T1 and T2 can uh, uh, demonstrate clearly the presence of brain tissue as well as some of the CSF in the uh, encephalocele. Encephalo this is axial CT images and coronal T1 weighted MR image showing the defect in the anterior part of the uh, cribriform plate of ethmoids the meningeal sac containing brain tissue, and also you can uh, appreciate the presence of brain tissue in uh, this uh, encephalocele. Encephalocele um, uh, can be evaluated by CT and MRI. CT will show the bony defect, MRI will show the contents. If there is only CSF or this CSF is associated with uh, uh, some of the disorganized brain tissue. And sometimes we can have the 3D reformatted images by CT for accurate evaluation of the bone defect. Some of the associated anomalies with uh, encephalocils include a genesis of the corpus callosum, hydrocephalus, and hollow prosencephalus. This is what we call the basal encephalocele, where there is herniation of the CSF through the posterior part of the cribriform plate of eighth mines. And through the defect also, the pituitary uh, stalk as well as the pituitary gland are also seen herniating through uh, the defect. And this uh, issue, which is known as areas of arrested uh, pneumatization, involves typically the area of the basi sphenoid. And this is well known by the, uh, the name don't touch lesion. The, uh, this is not a lesion actually, it is just a, a, a non pneumatization of an area which is uh, intimately related to the sphenoid. Uh, signs. Then uh, this area on CT uh, can be easily diagnosed, but on MRI it may be mistaken for a tumor. And pneumatization of the skull base and the baronasal sinuses start at the age of four months, and it continue to the young adulthood. First, the red bone marrow is replaced by fatty marrow before pneumatization. Then the fatty marrow is invaded by epithelial cells from the respiratory mucosa, and then pneumatization will uh, occur. And if you uh, see by CT and the gut, uh, this is very important criteria. An unexpanding lesion, internal curvilinear calcification, and the sclerotic marsh. On MRI, the presence of fat within the lesion uh, it signifies that this is not a tumor. Absence of any mass effect and no expansion. This, this lesion is not an expanding, an expanding lesion. Also, you can see the basal skull foramina which are not displaced or disrupted. And this is what we mean by arrested pneumatization. This is the normal pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus and here you can see that part good part of the sphenoid sinus especially the left one is non-pneumatized with uh, uh, an area of fat and bone marrow trabecially uh, uh, replacing the air but you can uh, easily appreciate that the vatian canal as well as the foramen rotundum are intact and not displaced or eroded by the lesion. This is the uh, usual appearance of arrested pneumatization of the skull base by CT. There is bone marrow in the, uh, uh, along the left side of the sphenoid sinus, but this is the normal appearance 
uh, if complete pneumatization occurred. And here you can see arrested pneumatization, and you see this is the greater wing, uh, the pterygoid blades, and also the uh, left side to the sphenoid sinus, there is an area of uh, loss of pneumatization compared to the right one. Another example showing the arrested pneumatization to the left side of the sphenoid sinus, with only this part is pneumatized. This is the normal appearance uh, by CT. But look by MRI, if you uh, look carefully here in this uh, axial T1 both contrast and axial T2 weighted images, and you can see a lesion which is of uh, low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 and there is no significant enhancement uh, in the boost contrast images and many times you may uh, you may feel that this is a skull based tumor or a nasopharyngeal mass invading in the skull base or what or uh, or something like this but if you go to the CT scan and you can solve the problem very easily where you can see normal uh, bone distribution and tropically uh, intact cortical bone, no evidence of uh, destruction or erosion. And uh, by MRI, uh, this may be uh, included in the differential diagnosis of arrested pneumatization, fibrous dysplasia, ossifying fibroma, chondrosarcoma, osteomyelitis, Chordoma and bone uh, metastasis. Then, uh, in in contrast to arrested pneumatization, all these conditions lack the presence of internal fat within the lesion, and usually show signs of mass effect on the adjacent structures. Then we came to the fibrous dysplasia, which uh, I think is well known for all of you. This is a developmental abnormality, affects any bone in the body, and it has two main types, the monostotic type, which uh, presents by a single lesion, and the polystotic type, which affects many of the bones in the body. Uh, head and neck involvement by fibrous dysplasia is about, in about 10 to 25% in monostotic uh, form, and in 50% in patients with polystotic fibrous displays. The major uh, diagnostic uh, imaging finding of fibrous dysplasia is bone expansion and the ground glass uh, appearance. There is no uh, bone destruction, no extraosseous uh, soft tissue component. You should remember that this lesion will, will show significant tracer uptake in bone scan because these lesions are metabolically active. By MRI, it is advised that in cases of fibrosis lesions, please don't try to diagnose these lesions by MRI alone, otherwise you will uh, make some uh, uh, mistakes. Here you see a very big lesion in the skull base and the, the calvarium on the right side, which may sometimes mimic a tumor. The fibrous uh, tissue usually show significant contrast enhancement, and this will be evident on MRI, of course. In the T2-weighted images, most of the lesions may show low signal, as you can see here, but uh, some of the lesions due to the presence of uh, cystic changes will show high T2 signal. You should remember that fibrous dysplasia is a metabolically active lesion and the sarcomatous transformation is considered rare, representing less than half percent of the cases and is usually uh, transformed into osteosarcoma. These are uh, two images for a fibrous dysplasia of the anterior cranial fossa as well as the temporal bone, squamous part of the temporal bone, lateral orbital wall. You see the difference between MRI and CT. The lesion is clearly 
uh, demonstrated in the CT images and there may be mistaken here for many other uh, possibilities. This is a fibrous, extensive fibrous dysplasia of the skull base affecting the anterior and middle and also the posterior skull base with encroachment on the orbital cavities as well as the ethmoidal air cells clearly demonstrated by CT. Another example of skull-based fibrous dysplasia affecting the region of the sphenoid sinus, the pituitary fossa, as well as the posterior ethmoids. And this is a localized form of fibrous dysplasia involving the left maxillary antrum, part of the heart palate, as well as the alveolar marsh. Then we came to the uh, mucoceles, which uh, are uh, inflammatory lesions of the paranasal sinuses, leading to uh, accumulation of uh, secretion or inflammatory material inside the sinus, which by time will expand uh, too much to encroach on the adjacent structures. Uh, the mucoceles are common in the frontal sinuses, less common in the ethmoids, and more or less common in the maxillary antrum. This is a huge frontal uh, mucosil by CT involving the frontal sinuses with marked expansion and thinning of the uh, bony margins with significant encroachment on the cranial cavity as well as the orbit, of course. And here you can see the mucosil by MRI and the T1 weighted image. The contents are uh, uh, somewhat bright because of the mucinous content or the high proteinaceous content of the lesion. On uh, T2 weighted images, the contents are uh, somewhat darker and uh, uh, you see the significant encroachment of the lesion on the cranial cavity. Uh, mucoceles on uh, MRI sometimes they show a uh, dark signal on T2 weighted images and they show bright signal on the T1 weighted image. After contrast injection, they will not show uh, enhancement or they may show only marginal uh, contrast enhancement. And this is the appearance of a frontal mucosil with bony expansion on the right side. A frontal uh, frontal ethmoidal mucosil by MRI you see the uh, expansion of the frontal sinus as well as the ethmoidal air cells encroaching on the ostium of the right maxillary side of the left maxillary sinus, which accumulates uh, secretions. An infection of the baronasal sinuses by fungus may be seen in immune competent patients and also in immune compromised patients. This is known as allergic uh, fungal sinusitis in immune content, invasive fungal sinusitis in immune compromise. And they said usually that invasive uh, fungal sinusitis is diagnosed by the presence of extensive bone destruction and invasion of the surrounding structures, while the allergic fungal sinusitis is, uh, has an expanding nature and less uh, uh, bone destructive changes. Uh, fungal sinusitis will uh, cause some erosion of the adjacent uh, uh, bones, especially the ethmoids, the orbital wall, the cribriform plate of ethmoid, with uh, consequent extension into the nasopharynx or the pterygomaxillary space, intracranial and intraorbital extension. You remember that uh, the fungus will appear hyperdense in the CT images even without contrast injection, and it will appear very dark on T2 weighted MRI images. This is an example of uh, uh, fungal sinusitis uh, uh, expanding and eroding the ethmoidal air cells with orbital encroachment as well as uh, some er erosive changes in the skull base with intracranial bulge of the lesion. Another example of allergic fungal sinusitis affecting the sphenoid, the ethmoid, and the frontal sinuses with uh, little bone erosion of the 
orbital roof and uh, some intracranial extension. And uh, these are the imaging findings of fungal sinusitis, which include uh, the presence of hyperdense uh, material. And um, sometimes we have a peripheral hypodensity, which uh, represents the retained secretions. And also you have hypointensity on T2 in particular, uh, weighted images. Uh, if you inject uh, contrast, you may see peripheral marginal uh, enhancement. The treatment of fungal sinusitis will include surgery and this tried uh, therapy. And the recurrence rate is not uncommon. This is a case of fungal sinusitis showing the classic appearance on CT images. The sinuses are a little are a little bit expanded. They contain hyperdense material. There is some erosive changes of the uh, bony margins. And uh, uh, the inflammatory material, uh, inflammatory uh, changes has extended into, uh, have extended into the frontal signs. Then uh, expansion of the involved sinus, remodeling or thinning of the bony sinus wall Erosion of the sinus wall can be seen. On MRI, you may see light or slight hyperintensity of the fungus on T1 weighted images, but on T2 weighted images, you see very dark appearance of the fungus simulating air. And if you inject contrast material, you may got marginal peripheral contrast enhancement of the lesions. This is the classic appearance by CT. Then we came to the trauma and the CSF leaks and skull base fractures are rare and account for about 4% in cases of severe head injury. Uh, uh, these will involve in particular the temporal bone as well as the cribriform plate of ismites. The, uh, the clinical presentation is somewhat uh, evident and uh, the aim of imaging is to detect the site of uh, CSF uh, leak. Then we used to use uh, CT after injection of intrathecal contrast material to uh, help in detection of the site of uh, leak. But uh, uh, nowadays we may use the coronal, true coronal MRI uh, of T2 weighted image of the paranasal sinuses in order to elicit this uh, CSF leak. And here you can see there is a defect in the cribriform blade of ethmoids on the right side, and this is the contrast material injected intrathecally, uh, opacifying the CSF and going through the defect, and this is a sure sign of uh, CSF rhinorrhea. And many times we used to put some cotton uh, bleachets in the uh, nasal fossa and look for uh, their staining by the injected contrast material. This is one of the confirmatory findings if there is a CSF rhinorrhea. And you know that rhinorrhea is maybe mistaken by allergic sinusitis and you are not sure about the fluid coming from the nose if it represents the inflammatory sinus secretion or through CSF. Then here you see the, the defect in the, in the cribriform plate of eighth mites, and you see this is the before an in intrathecal injection of the contrast. After intrathecal injection of contrast, you see the contrast material going through the defect, and you look to the nasal pledge so we can see that both are stained by the contrast material. It is better to have pre-contrast scans for better delineation of the defect because uh, many times if you injected intrathecal contrast material, the, the hyper density of the contrast may mask the site of the fracture or the defect. And here he, there is a suspected defect in the cribriform blade of ethmoids in the pre-contrast images Post-contrast images show that the contrast material is leaking through the defect going into uh, maybe through the nose. And uh, using MRI in the true coronal means that you put the patient in the wrong position and you scan uh, the head and the skull base 
for uh, to demonstrate that the CSF, uh, or which is a bright signal in this situated image, will go through the defect in the anterior cranial fossa, and uh, th this may uh, obviate the need to inject contrast material intrathecally and so on. And uh, sometimes if there is a defect here, there may be some of the air leaking uh, through the defect into uh, the cranial cavity. And here you can see these uh, very dark signals in the CSF denoting pneumocephalus. And in this MRI, and you can see uh, uh, localized high signal intensity in the sphenoid sinus which may represent sinusitis. But uh, here you can see it uh, very clearly, the bony defect by CT scan, and you know the cause of uh, CSF rhinorrhea. And this uh, this just to show the value of CT and MRI. And the CT scan, you can easily appreciate that the site of the defect. And MRI, you can see CSF going through the defect. But uh, sometimes you can see the defect also by uh, MRI. Then we came to the uh, anterior skull-based tumors. And when we have uh, the uh, common sinonasal malignancies, which include uh, inverted babyloma, then this is a benign lesion, carcinoma, lymphoma, melanoma, fibrous histiocytoma, fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, and metastatic busts. Also, we have the olfactory uh, neuroblastoma or ECC no, neuroblastoma and olfactory groove meningioma. Then uh, you remember that we have uh, uh, explained in details uh, these tumors in the sector of uh, baronesal sinus imaging. Then this is the inverted babyloma, which represents about 75% a percent of babylomas in the baronasal sinuses. The etiology is unknown and is commonly seen in middle-aged males presenting by unilateral nasal obstruction. And uh, in cases of babyloma, you, you got uh, expansion of the nasal cavity and uh, uh, opacification of the epsilateral maxillary uh, sinus and um, uh, usually, there is obliteration of the ethmoidal air cells. And th this is very important to differentiate this lesion from the uh, more common anthroquinal polyp, where the sinus is expanded, not the nasal fossa, and the, the ethmoidal air cells are usually clear. One of the important landmarks for inverted babyloma is what's known as convoluted cerebriform pattern. Where if you look to this lesion in T2 weighted image, and you can see what looks like cerebral tissue. And this is one of the uh, diagnostic landmarks of inverted uh, babylon. The CT features are usually uh, non-specific, but if you refer to what I, I have said, you can uh, many times spot the diagnosis of this lesion. And the soft tissue mass may, may show enhancement, and it occurs on the lateral nasal wall related to the middle uh, turbinate and the maxillary ostium. Calcification and hyperostosis can be seen, which can help in, in the diagnosis. Uh, the convoluted cerebriform pattern is uh, seen in about 50 to 100% of cases and is considered one of the uh, uh, pneumonic findings that is not seen in other sinonasal uh, tumors. And this is an example of inverted uh, babyloma in the uh, nasal fossa and uh, the maxillary sinus. And as I have mentioned that uh, the one of the major differential diagnoses of this lesion is the anthroquinal bulb. In, uh, an inverted babyloma of the maxillary sinus showing uh, of the nose, showing the typical cerebriform pattern. In this t weighted image with obstruction of the sin sinus ostium and retained secretions within the sinus. 
This lesion is histologically benign, but it may contain foci of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Bone destruction by pressure erosion is seen, but extensive destruction which simulate malignancy is not uh, well known for this tumor. And uh, the lesion, as I have mentioned, to some contrast enhancement. Then if you uh, came to the sinonasal malignancies, malignancies are more common in the maxillary sinus, less common in the ethmoids, and more or less common in the nasal cavity. The symptoms of sinonasal malignancies may simulate chronic sinusitis, but uh, sometimes you got rhinorrhea, facial pain, paresthesia, uh, uh, tooth loosening, exophthalmos, epiphora, and uh, uh, bloody nasal discharge. Uh, uh, the most important imaging finding of malignancies in the paranasal sinuses is bone destruction. In not expansion, but bone destruction. And you see a soft tissue mass centered to the maxillary antrum with destruction of the orbital floor, the uh, inferior wall of the maxillary sinus, the heart, the palate, and part of the zygoma. And this is nicely presented in this 3D uh, reformatted image. And it's an ismoidal carcinoma by CT and MRI. You see a mass centered to the right ethmoids with erosion of the cribriform plate, intraorbital extension, erosion of the bony nasal septum. This is post contrast T1 uh, MRI image showing the tumor extension inside the orbit as well as some of the tumor has extended intracranially as well. And uh, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma involving the ethmoidal air cells with intraorbital extension on both sides, more on the right, as well as intracranial extension. Uh, during this lecture, you will, you will uh, see many of the lesions simulate this appearance. And uh, 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 to, to start with, and we have to uh, consider this lesion as one of three. Number one, carcinoma. Number two, olfactory neuroblastoma. Number three, lymphoma. Number four, metastatic deposits. And uh, these are uh, the common differential diagnoses for such a lesion centered to the ethmoids with some intracranial uh, extension. And you see here, sinonasal undifferentiated uh, carcinoma involving the maxillary sinus as well as the ethmoidal air cells with uh, significant bone destruction of the orbital wall, intraorbital extension, destruction of the nasal uh, septum and uh, crossing to the opposite side of the nose, erosion of the zygoma and extension in the subcutaneous area. And here you see the, uh, the rest of the study in the axial images in the tumor you can appreciate very easily the aggressiveness of bone destructive changes. And as I have mentioned, if you see a lesion which is uh, uh, centered to the ethmoidal air cells, either unilateral or bilateral, with uh, some extension into the adjacent orbit or both orbits, as well as intracranial extension, then the differential diagnosis will include acetino neuroplastoma or olfactory groove neuroplastoma, squamous cell carcinoma, metastasis, and lymphoma. These are the, the common lesions that can be included in the differential diagnosis. Also, you may include meningioma sometimes in melanoma, and this uh, particular tumor, which is known as sinonasal undifferentiated uh, carcinoma. And uh, lymphoma uh, affects the uh, uh, head and uh, affects the skull base in about 24% of the uh, head and neck lesions. It is usually of the non Hodgkin B cell type, and uh, the lymphoma of the nasal cavity may be of the T cell type. Lymphoma, as I have mentioned many times before, it can involve the orbit, the nasopharynx, the jaw, any part of the head and neck can be involved by lymphoma. 
and uh, also uh, extension to the intracranium is also uh, is also common and here you can see a mass which is infiltrating the ethmoidal air cells, post maxillary sinuses, encroaching or extending inside the orbit. And as I have mentioned, that lymphoma is considered one of the four common lesions affecting this area. By CT, lymphoma will show a bulky soft tissue mass, which uh, destroys the adjacent bones, and it will show almost homogeneous post-contrast enhancement. Similar findings are also seen on, on MRI. And this is uh, a lesion which is destroying the posterior ethmoids, filling the sphenoid sinus with erosion of the sinus floor as well as the left lateral wall. And it was uh, proved to be lymphoma. But carcinoma is, of course, metastases are also considered in this area. Another example by MRI T1 weighted images showing an infiltrative lesion of the maxillary sinus, the infratemporal fossa, the nasal fossa, uh, showing low signal in the T1-weighted images with some intraorbital extension diagnosed as lymphoma. I have mentioned that uh, diffusion-weighted images are uh, considered uh, very important in head and neck imaging and also in the skull-based evaluation where the tumors will show uh, restricted uh, diffusion, as you can see in this uh, particular uh, lesion, affecting the nasal fossa and extending into the maxillary sinus with uh, some bright signal in the diffusion weighted images and dark signal in the, in the ADC map. Another example of uh, sinonasal uh, lymphoma. Uh, affecting part of the oropharynx, the, the pterygoid muscles in the infratemporal fossa, the maxillary sinus, the, knee, the nasal bone, and uh, extending as well into the sphenoid sinus. The differential diagnosis of non Hodgkin lymph of lymphoma of the skull base with, will include the four important uh, lesions as uh, carcinoma, isidino-neuroplastoma and the metastatic disease. And uh, this is uh, one of the well-known tumors of the uh, skull base or the anterior skull base, which is known as the olfactory neuroplastoma or isidino neuroplastoma. Neuroendocrine malignancy of the neural uh, crest, and it arises from the olfactory epithelium of the superior nasal cavity. It affects adolescents and middle-aged uh, patients presenting by nasal obstruction and epistaxis. And this tumor is hypervascular and may bleed significantly during biopsy. There are a lot of imaging findings for this lesion, including the presence of a dumbbell-shaped mass, part intracranial, part in the ismites constricted at the skull base, the upper portion intracranial, the lower portion intranasal, the waist is at the cribriform plate of ethmoids. Calcifications are well known in this tumor as well as the cyst formation, especially at the border, separating the tumor from the brain. And these cysts may consider one of the uh, pathognomonic landmarks, but is not seen in, in every case. Then, uh, destruction of the cribriform plate of ethmoids, considerable enhancement on CT or, and MRI. Uh, large tumors may have central areas of necrosis. 20% of the cases may have nodal metastasis at presentation. The treatment is by resection and radiotherapy, uh, but the, the recurrence is well known. This is a highly malignant lesion and uh, seen usually in young men, but uh, there is another peak for this tumor at the age between 50 and 60 years. Uh, it's commonly seen in the superior lateral aspect of the nasal cavity, this area, and uh, that's why it uh, easily extends intracranial as well as intranasal. Then, uh, this is a, another example where you see the tumor in the T1-weighted image and in the T2-weighted image. It's a locally invasive tumor, 
that affects the nasal fossa and the paranasal sinuses with frequent intraorbital and intracranial extension. Obstruction of the sinus uh, draining uh, openings may lead to inflammatory sinusitis. Distant metastasis in about 20% of cases. And it's well known that uh, carcinoma and lymphoma show less aggressive pattern of bone destruction compared to the olfactory neuroblastoma. In here, you see a mass in the, uh, in the nasal cavity and also invaded the orbit. In the sagittal image, part of the tumor is seen intracranially and part is seen in the uh, nasal fossa and nasopharynx as well. And this is olfactory neuroblastoma in a patient with rhinorrhea and epistaxis. The tumor is big, infiltrating mainly the left side of the nose, as well as most of the orbital cavity with intracranial extension. And you see that uh, the tumor is uh, more or less homogeneously enhancing. This is uh, what's known as the uh, micro or macro cysts at the periphery uh, or the border of the tumor between the tumor and the brain. You may got some cysts here. These cysts may be very small or maybe sizable like this. They are characteristic, but they are not seen in every case. The differential diagnosis of is a scene of new olfactory neuroblastoma will include sinonasal carcinoma, metastasis, and lymphoma. You may include uh, sometimes melanoma and uh, meningioma and also granulomatous disease. But remember the four uh, main lesions included in the differential diagnosis in this area for this appearance are the lymphoma, ethmoidal carcinoma, olfactory neuroblastoma, and skull base metastasis. And meningioma in the olfactory groove will simulate, and this is known as a subfrontal meningioma, will simulate any meningioma anywhere. And uh, it's uh, commonly a homogeneously enhanced lesion of intermediate signal in the T1 and T2 weighted image. And sometimes you can see the CSF cleft sign, which is an indication of extra axial lesion. And I have explained this many times in the uh, lecture of uh, brain tumors. Then uh, this lesion may uh, show uh, matrix calcification and may uh, also uh, lead to reactionary bone sclerosis of the related uh, skull base bones and may uh, also uh, show dural enhancement, which is known as the dural uh, tail. This is a classic appearance of uh, olfactory groove meningioma showing intermediate signal in the T1, T2, and the flare with homogeneous post contrast enhancement in the classic uh, uh, CSF cleft uh, sign around the tumor. And you know that uh, meningioma, because of the cellularity, will show restricted diffusion in diffusion weighted images. And uh, this is one of the criteria of meningioma and the lymphoma in diffusion weighted images. They show diffusion restriction because of the cellularity. And uh, it appears iso intense in the T1 weighted image, iso or hyper intense in the T2 weighted images, dural tail, uh, restricted diffusion, and uh, the MRS will show the characteristic peak of alanine as I have mentioned in the lecture of MR spectroscopy. Then uh, uh, perilegional edema is variable uh, around the demeningioma and is not a landmark for aggressiveness. And uh, 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 calcium may be present in the meningioma, but uh, better uh, seen by uh, CT since MRI is not so much sensitive to the presence of calcium, homogeneous contrast enhancement, cystic component of the meningioma is well known uh, uh, finding in what's known as a cystic meningioma. Finally, we came to the metastasis. Metastasis affect any part of the head and the neck and any part of the skull base. Then the diagnosis is usually depends on 
the uh, clinical history of a known primary malignancy. But in this patient, there is severe pain and the progressive proptose. The MRI showed a destructive lesion in the lateral aspect of the orbital roof as well as the adjacent part of the frontal bone. Then they thought that this lesion is a primary lacrimal gland carcinoma. And after surgery, they found that this tumor is a metastatic deposit from a small lung cancer that was obscured by pulmonary uh, fibrosis. And this patient got some uh, enhancement of the dura and the enhancement of the optic nerve. Then uh, this was thought to be a meningioma of the uh, clinoid as well as the optic nerve. This patient is known to have breast cancer and uh, the surgical biopsy confirmed that this is a metastatic deposit from the breast carcinoma. And this patient is known to have metastatic mesenchymal chondrosarcoma presented by progressive optic neuropathy. The CT scan preoperative showed a destructive mass in the greater wing of the sphenoid as well as the lateral orbital wall with significant extra osseous soft tissue component encroaching on the orbital cavity. Then uh, this MRI is obtained after surgery with a removal of the metastatic deposit and improvement of the uh, visual acuity. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin.